Now, we have seen a number of different prophetic schemes. And I'm going to do something in 9, 11, and 12 in one fell swoop. Okay? I know we did 9, but I need, you to, I need to set this up. Um, I'm going to set this up by being really straightforward with you. I don't like bats. I, um, in fact, they creep me out. During my archaeological training, I uh, went with a group of students not far from Bethlehem to Wadi Tekoa. Now, you got to know what happened. I had a couple roommates that were, frankly, Looney Tunes. I was a perfectly reasonable young man with a rational thought process, but it was my roommates who led me astray. May I just underscore that at the beginning of my statement? We decided we would go into Wadi Tekoa, which is near where Amos was born in, uh, in the Judean wilderness. And so we, we got into this cave and man, I'm scratching just thinking about it. I can't stand bats. We got into this cave and we had to crawl back and we thought we were gonna be archeological sleuths. So we went back in this cave that had never been excavated and we, we get to the back of the cave and we're, we're digging back there. Now the problem is the cave came down and got narrower and narrower and narrower. So you had to crawl through um, bat dung, you know, by the, by the pound as you were making your way back. And the bats were hanging over your head because it was so far back there, it was dark. So you're taking this flashlight in your mouth, I guess, and you're going to get through the cave and there's bats hanging over you. And I was like totally freaked out by this. I mean, if the condition of the floor wasn't bad, the condition of the ceiling was horrible. Then, you know, I mean, honestly, did you ever look at bats? They're hairy rodents with wings. They're the nastiest looking things you've ever seen in your life. And somehow in my mind, they would like, like go in my hair and eat my brains. I don't know why I thought that, but I just thought from my growing up days and horror stories that that was gonna happen. And, and I, I tell you what, I was absolutely terrified of them. Well. The bats were thick in the back of this cave, and, uh, and the cave was as dark as pitch, even though it's midday outside. You know, you go outside, you can't see a thing. You come back in, it gets so dark. And um, what I found most unsettling was that I, I, I couldn't see anything as I crawled forward because the bat dung was getting in the way of my face. Now, I, I, at the time, I had a really long beard. <laughs> I mean, my beard was down to here, okay? So I'm crawling and it's like get, picking up bat dung in my beard. And I'm going through this and I'm thinking to myself, you stupid roommates, why am I doing what they said, you know? But at any rate, as I'm going back there, there was this eerie darkness and there's no way to explain the depth of a cave when it's pitch black. And um, incredibly scary experience. But I, I had to come to realize that I absolutely treasured my sight. So we got back inside the cave and there was a, um, I don't know what they call these, it was like a chimney, a natural chimney in the top. And when you crawled back so far, you got back inside this big open cave and it was lighted. It was like this, oh, you know, this light that came down. And none of the bats like to hang out back there. The biggest problem I had was in order to get back out of the cave, I was gonna have to crawl back through the bat dung on the other end. They, I, I actually, one of my roommates, um, Carl, took a picture of me with a big long beard with bat dung just hanging in every direction off of my face. It was absolutely disgusting. Anyway, um, what I learned from that is that I absolutely cannot stand being in places I don't see. Dark places, and especially dark places with hairy winged rodents in them. <laughs> now, y the truth of the matter is that a lot of people are fascinated by prophecy, but let's be honest, when you look forward, you can't see tomorrow. We have these charts and we all write them down, you know, but you can't see tomorrow. You have no idea how much easier it is for you to capt capture in your mind prophetic truth from the scripture than people a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, nobody could figure out how people all over the world could watch something at one time. And you just, it's natural. So as we get later, it's becoming more reasonable to understand prophecy. What I want you to understand is that everybody's going to, it's going to be perfectly reasonable. Everything they ask us to do is going to seem reasonable. Oh, you need to put a, you need to put a biometric chip on your forehead. Right now you go, that's ridiculous. But what if it was see-through, painless, and stopped virtually all um, breaches of security? 
What if you had a little camera on your little computer and it would just read the chip off your head and it would know your, you know, right now, for me to energize this, I put my finger on it. It reads my fingerprint. When I got on a flight yesterday, I looked in a thing and it read my pupil. Well, how hard would it be to put something on my head? It's gonna be perfectly reasonable. You keep watching and here's what you're gonna hear about security over and over and over. There's no way to make credit cards secure. There's no way to make identity secure. There's no way to do it until somebody's gonna say, you know what, we could just use biometrics. And it's all gonna be perfectly reasonable. They're not gonna come out with red suits and pitchforks and say, hi, we represent Satan and wanna put a stamp on your head. That's not how it's gonna happen. That's how people said it 100 years ago. Now believers are going, they couldn't buy or sell without this mark. Well, geez, that's as easy as a barcode. Look, history, history is his story. God is never surprised by the future. We will be, but he's not. The path of the future is like to him, like the path of the past. In his eyes, it's secure, it's known, it's unwavering, it's part of his hand. Now, there are seven parts to the prophecies Daniel received during the first year of Darius the Mede that are recorded in the book. And I wanna make, mark these out, and I want you to see them in your Bible, okay? It's important that you get this. We're gonna actually, the problem is they've been divided and separated in, in chapters. In, um, in Daniel 9, it starts, and then 11 and 12, it finishes. So I want you to understand that Daniel 9, 11, and 12 are like a set of an ongoing prophecy. I stepped off to tell you the lion's den story because it happens right around that time as an event. But the important thing is that 9, 11, and 12 are sort of like one picture. All right, so 9 to 24 and 27 is sort of like the, the, let's say the big picture of, or big frame of God's future for the Jewish people and for Jerusalem. It's gonna include both a timing of rebuild to the coming of Messiah, first coming. It's gonna include the detail that Messiah will come the first time but be cut off, adding to you the idea that he would come back. It's gonna give you the notion that Jerusalem's gonna be destroyed. It's gonna also end with the ultimate righteousness of the people. That's gonna all be inside of that. Now, I want you to take your Bible and go to 11.1 because there's, in 11.1, there's sort of a starting now, immediate future of the Median Kingdom. So, I'm not gonna do this slowly because if I do, it will be incredibly painful. Chapter 11 is one of the hardest chapters in the Bible to mark out prophecies in. Okay? So I'm going to just do it in a very light frame, but I'm going to do it as quickly as I possibly can because the detail of the prophecy will overwhelm you. Let's call Daniel 11, 1 is a prophecy of starting now. Now, let me say what this is. In Daniel 11, 1, let's read it first and then I'll establish what it is I mean. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia. Then a fourth king, then, then a fourth will gain more, uh, more riches than all of them as soon as he becomes strong in his riches. I want you to see something. Daniel offers an encouragement to a king whose name is Syaxares or Darius. And um, it's about the immediate future of his kingdom. This is one of the purposes of God's word. It's to be an encouragement. Prophecy wasn't in, supposed to just give you weird details about the future. It was supposed to be an encouragement, okay? So in verse one, it says that God not only opened the door to the whole future of Israel like he did up here, here, he opens the door to the immediate future, that is the Medo-Persian Empire, and what's going to happen right then, all right? Let me show it to you very quickly. I, I don't want to take a lot of detailed time, but I'll, I'll at least touch it uh, lightly. It says, the encouragement is this in verse 1, there shall stand up yet three kings. 
Now Gabriel already spoke of Cyrus, who is now co-reigning, and after him three others would arise. Why would this be encouraging to the king? Why would verse 1, Darius here, and there will be three other kings, three more kings. Why would this be important? There's a, the, your kingdom is going to last for a while. There's going to be other kings. And in fact, these other kings did arise. And they're not as familiar as, as, as many in our day, but the, um, they're called the Achaemenid Empire. And, uh, and, and basically, it was a very large kingdom. The rulers that are referred to here, if you're keeping track, are Cyrus II, a fellow by the name of Cambyses, and Darius I, and finally Xerxes, his son, is the fourth king that was prophesied to be far richer and was demonstrated in his, in his uh, uh, Esther I. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure you know who these are. Okay? So after you, this is after Darius, they're going to become... Cyrus the second, and he's going to be 529 to 522, and Cambyses, and he is going to be, that's his son, and he is 521 to 486 BC, after him is going to be Darius the Great, Um, he's going to be 486 to 465. And then finally, there's one last one who's far richer, and he's going to be Xerxes. He's going to be Xerxes the first. And why is Xerxes the first important? Because he's from Esther chapter 1. Xerxes the first. And... Um, so he's going to, he's come in to, he, by the way, his, what's his other name? Anybody know what his other name is? Yeah. It's actually the way you say it is a Hashverosh, but the, it, wrote, it writes out as a Hasawaras, a Hashverosh. Okay. Essentially, here's what I want you to see. He says, I'm going to tell you there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are going to reign after you. I need you to not be worried about whether or not your kingdom is going to be over right away. So starting now with Darius the Mede, I want you to know there's going to be another king, another king, another king, and then finally a fourth one that's going to be more powerful and richer than all the others. The most important thing you need to take out of this is sometimes prophecy gives you a big sweep of history. Sometimes it just tells one guy one thing. That's all it's for. And all you take away from this is Darius the Mede, don't worry. Following you is going to be Cyrus Cambyses, Darius the Great, and all the way down to Xerxes the First. Relax your kingdoms in place for a long time. That's 11.1. Okay? So... The first prophecy is a summary one. The second one is starting right now, let me tell you what you need to know. Then there's a third prophecy. Do you notice I'm doing this very quickly because I don't want you to dive into the Achaemenid Empire and know all the history of the Achaemenid Empire. That if you do this and you do it well, you'll study these guys. But for right now, it's enough for you to understand what the point of the prophecy is. And the point of the prophecy is, relax, you've got lots of relatives going to follow you on the throne. They'll be around for a while. That's good enough. Okay? Let's go to the third one. In verses 2 through 4, 11, 2 through 4, there's another prophecy. Prophecy number 3. And for lack of a better term, I'm going to call this the buck goat prophecy. Or the rise of the Greeks. Okay? There's going to be a rise of the... Now, look at verse 2. He will arouse the whole empire against the realm of Greece. In other words, there's going to be Xerxes who's going to arouse his entire empire against someone uh, uh, of the Greeks. And a mighty king will arise... He will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. Who is that? At the time 
There'll be a mighty king by the name of Al. Alexander the Great will rise. And as he has risen, his kingdom will be broken up and parceled out to the four points of the compass, though not to his own descendants, nor according to his authority, which he wielded, for his sovereignty will be uprooted and given to others beside him. So, swift in conquest, the Greeks swept the world, but their kingdom was quickly divided at the death of Alexander the Great. And how was it divided? It was di divided between the four, they're called the Diadoche. The Diadoche are four generals, Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, and they are not his relatives. They're just people that followed him, that took over in his place and d divided up his kingdom. Now, what's the lesson? If here, relax, you've got a lot of people. Here, you need to know something. Swift and powerful can also be short-lived. Okay? So, Al's going to be incredibly powerful for all of 10 years, and then he's going to die. He's going to rise like a rocket, drop like a rock. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be all over for him in no time. He will flame out on stage being incredibly popular, and then after his death, they will remember him on the discount rack. That's basically what's going to happen to Al. And the important thing is when you step away from it, can you see the difference in the prophecies? This is big and huge about the Hebrews. This is right to a guy to encourage him. This is right to the heart of one who says, it's not about how big you are. If you don't last, it won't matter. Okay? Let's go on just one more, and then we'll take a break. Let's do the fourth one of our set of prophecies. And there are seven that we're going to do all together. The fourth one is a complicated, verses 5 to 20, 11, 5 to 20. And Ben told me earlier that if I tried to get him to teach this passage, he would want to raise. Okay? This is one of the most complicated passages in Scripture. It has to do with, it's a long, simple story of a fight between two kingdoms. Out of the four kingdoms of the Diadolche, there are two in the east, both that regard things that happen with the Jewish people. One of them in Egypt is called the Ptolemy family. The other one in Syria is called the Seleucid family. And the Ptolemies end up taking on the Seleucids. All right, what's the matter? Here's the problem. The problem is the Ptolemies control this. The Seleucids control this over to the Persian Gulf. Ptolemies, Seleucids. Originally, the Ptolemies also controlled Israel. And the Ptolemies were more or less lovers, not so much fighters. The Seleucids, they had their moments up in Syria and over in Assyria and over to, over to Babylon, Nineveh, all those places. But they, they were more warlike. Originally, the Ta Ptolemy Philadelphus, for instance, is the one who establishes the, one of the world's great libraries. He's more of a, you know, of a genteel, let's read a book, okay? So the Ptolemies originally control Israel. But Israel becomes the buffer between Seleucids and Ptolemies. When this becomes the land between two great powers, where are they going to fight all their battles? On your turf. Why should they fight it on their own turf when they can fight it on yours? And so as a result, 5 through 20 is a series, a long series of wars that go on. And what's interesting is it's very, very hard. I could give you the names of all of these people and how, the, how it plays out, but it'll absolutely drive you crazy. Let's just pick out a few of them in verse 5. Then the king of the south, that's a Ptolemy, that's Egypt. Then, then the king of the south will grow strong according to one of his princes who will gain ascendancy over him and obtain a dominion. His dominion will be a great dominion indeed. After some years they will form an alliance and the daughter of the king of the south, by the way, her name is Bernanke, um, later on in history, the, uh, the king of the south is, is, Ptolemy, uh, is Ptolemy Philadelphus. He will come to the king of the north. This is Antiochus. 
to carry out a peaceful arrangement. But she will not retain her position of power, nor will he remain with his power, but she will be given up along with those who brought her in and the one who sired her as well as he who supported her in those times. There's going to be a breakup of their marriage, is what he's saying. This is all before it happens. The king of the Ptolemies, Philadelphos, is going to pledge his daughter up to the Seleucids. They're going to have a marriage, then it's going to break up. That's what he's saying. Verse 7, but one of the descendants of her line will arise in his place and he will come against their army and will enter the fortress of the king of the north and he will deal with them and display great strength. Also their gods with their metal images and their precious uh, vessels of silver and gold he will take into captivity to Egypt and he on his part will refrain from attacking the king of the north for some years. The latter will enter the realm of the king of the south, but he will return to his own land. So it's about a series of fights that occur in 219 BC. This is long before the fights occur, but there are fights over a girl and a broken up marriage. That's all I want you to know. That Daniel gives a prophecy that says these two kingdoms are going to be fighting against one another. It's going to have to do with a girl, which, by the way, from the time of ancient Troy, we know, you know, girls are really the problem. But anyway, so they're fighting over this whole, this girl, and they're fighting over the breakup of a marriage, and they're fighting over a disintegration of the relationship between the Ptolemies and Seleucids, and that happens in the year 219. He doesn't know what year it's going to happen, but that's the year it happened, because he's looking forward to it, we're looking back on it. Verse 10, his sons will mobilize and assemble a multitude of great forces and one of them will keep coming, keep on coming and overflow and pass through that he may again wage war up to the very fortress. The king of the south will be enraged and go forth and fight with the king of the north. Then the latter will raise a great multitude that, but that multitude will be given into the hand of the former. He says, Ptolemy the fourth Philopater will come up and he will fight Antiochus the third and at Raphia in the year 217, there'll be a great battle and one will lose to the other. That's, that's what happened. Daniel doesn't know what this is about. He just knows he's being told these things and he's, and he's making the details known. Verse 13, for the king of the north will ri rise again with a greater multitude than the former. And after an interval of some years, he will press on with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times, many will rise up against the king of the south, the violent ones among your people. Who's your people? Jews will get involved, will also lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they will fall down. Jews will get involved trying to fight alongside of one of them, but they will get knocked down. Verse 15, then the king of the north will come, cast a siege ramp, capture a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground, not even their choicest troops, for there will be no strength to take a stand. It's interesting. That's, that, that city became the port of Sidon. In Tyre and Sidon and Lebanon, this is the fall of Sidon, and it's predicted here. Then the king of the north will come, cast up a siege ramp, cast a well-fortified city and the forces of the south will not stand their ground. Verse 16, but he who comes against him will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land with destruction in his hand. What's the beautiful land? This is Israel, and, it said, and this is Antiochus IV. You know of this guy. He's the first bounce of the two bounces that we saw earlier, <laughs> when we were dealing in chapter 7. Here, here he is, Antiochus IV. He's all, also called by a nickname that means the one who just discovered he's God. What, what is that nickname? Epiphanes. Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Okay. Now, I want you to see this because it's going to be, it's going to be layered, but look at, the, look at the detail of it. He will set his face to come with the power of his whole kingdom. He's a, he is a Seleucid, a northern kingdom guy, bringing up with him a proposal of peace, which he will put into effect. He will also give him a daughter of, of women to ruin it. But she will not take a stand for him or be on his side. It's an interesting kind of backstory here, but 
um, there's a whole fight that goes on with Antiochus. And then it says in verse 18, he will turn his face to the coastland. It looks like the Greek islands is what he's thinking of and capture many, but a commander will put a stop to his scorn against him. Moreover, he will repay him for his scorn. So he will turn his face toward the fortresses of his own land, but he will stumble and fall and be found no more. Then in his place, one will arise who will send an oppressor through the jewel of his kingdom. Yet within a few days, he will be shattered, though not in anger nor in battle. He's, he's telling a story. He's trying to play out the story of what's going on in about 200 to 175 BC. This is the story of two battles or battles that are going on a series of battles between kings of the north and the south. I want to stop there and say this. This prophecy is earthbound. The text presents a physical war of peace treaties. This is not heavenly conflict. This is a simple um, confirmation of a set of things that happen. I can take you to the history. I could mark every one of those battles and put a label on them and tell you where they were fought and when. I could tell you who all the rulers are. It's not necessary for you to know. At this point, here's what you want to know. You want to know that God will offer just enough evidence to commend us to uncover the truth when we find it. Here's the point of this. There's enough specificity, preciseness in these battles that as believers are going through them, can you imagine being a Jew during the intertestamental period and by now you have a copy of Daniel. Daniel was an incredibly popular book like in the Dead Sea Scrolls time, okay? Can you imagine having this and being able to see who's going to win the next battle as the North and the South come up against each other? We're living after this, but they were living in it. So they were using the Bible to confirm it as it was happening. Why would God do that? Why would he do that? So that believers who are passing through this terrible time, when you remember what we call the period of between Matthew and Malachi? People call it the silent years. It wasn't silent. God had details that were incredibly precise, more precise than anything they could read in the newspaper. But they needed to know the written word of God, not hear the verbal prophet. God wasn't silent. He was saying, grow up and read. And that's the point of this. So the fourth part of this seven parts of prophecy become important. All right. So we have a summary prophecy prophecy. We have a don't worry. It's going to happen right now. We have a, hey, this is how this is going to happen. Rise quick, fall like uh, just as lightning fast. And by the way, I'm writing things down, Dan, so that in the generations to come, believers will be able to be strengthened by the word because they're going to be reading it as predictive prophecy, but it's going to match what they see happening in the news. Now, I don't want you to get caught up in doing that now, but that was what it was for then. And the lesson is, very obviously, God is going to give just enough evidence to commend believers as he allows them to uncover the truth. Don't ask for proof. But you should know this. When somebody stands there and tells you the Bible isn't true, there is a mountain of evidence for its veracity. And what I keep finding is people who want to throw, you know, my buddy Ed, who comes in all the time to tell me, ah, it's all a bunch of lies, until I start burying him in all kinds of old details, and he's like, ah, oh, I don't understand any of that. No, you've already concluded it's not true, even though you don't know anything about it. Honestly, guys, I didn't give my life to a lie. I didn't chase around all those places and all those hours, all those years of going to all those places for a lie. What this does is gives you details of battles. Now, you could care less. I mean, come on. If I were you, would I care about some ancient battle in 217 BC? No. But if I was living in 217 and I already had a hot copy of who was going to win, do you think that would be important? You betcha. Okay.